Mr. Mario. But for Marco, fame came with a heavy price. I heard you or Mariella, both of you at some point said, don't worry, Daddy, I'll never change. But you do. Her meteoric rise thrust her into a jet-set world she was not prepared for. She turned to alcohol, drugs, and bulimia to mask her low self-esteem. So it was hard for her, because you'd look in the mirror and see one thing, and inside she didn't feel what she saw. Who knows what demons followed her around every day. She watched her career fizzle, and two marriages fail. But after years of self-abuse, Margot battled back. Okay, I can kill myself. It seemed like a pretty good option, but there's one <laughs> idea. Maybe I'll try it like <laughs> One by one, she conquered her addictions. Then, the ultimate irony. On July 1st, 1996, when it seemed that Margot had finally overcome her demons, her body was found in her Santa Monica apartment. The coroner ruled it a suicide, but to this day, many of her closest friends adamantly disagree. For the next two hours, Margot's life story unfolds. Through exclusive interviews, never-before-seen footage, and Margot's own words in audio reenactments, we'll hear from sister Mariel Hemingway and father Jack, as well as models Cheryl Teagues and Beverly Johnson, celebrity photographer Francesco Scavulo, film director Lamont Johnson, lifelong friends, lovers, and business associates all look back at the amazing life and tragic death of Margot Hemingway. The city of Portland, Oregon is known as the City of Roses, and it was here on a clear February day in 1955 that a true American beauty was born. Her name was Margot Byra Hemingway, and from first blush she delighted everyone with her vivacity and charm. Her father, Jack, raised in Paris and Idaho, was a consummate outdoorsman. He often indulged his passion for fly fishing with young Margot in tow. Her mother, Byra, also from Idaho, was of Native American descent. She was nicknamed Puck, short for Puckana, meaning little one. Margot also had an older sister, Joan, in the family called Muffet. And she also had a very special grandfather, whom the world called Papa. Ernest Hemingway was one of the most colorful figures in American literature. A vivid writer, author of more than 60 novels and short stories, he was honored with both Pulitzer and Nobel Prizes. Hemingway lived life as passionately as he wrote. He was an international bon vivant whose hunting and fishing exploits were legendary. Throughout his life, he lived in Europe, Cuba, and Key West, but it was Sun Valley, Idaho that became his final home. Margot spoke of him often, with pride, as we hear in this audio reenactment. I was very small, but I feel like I've had a real communication in his spirit. He loved the great outdoors, and I've been given that gift, being a Hemingway, loving the great outdoors and living life to the fullest. Ernest Hemingway died in 1961, when Margot was only six. And it wasn't until her teen years that she learned what the world already knew that after a long battle with alcohol and depression, Grandpapa had died by his own hand. Margot would face her own battles with alcohol in later years. Several months after Ernest's suicide, Margot's younger sister, Mariel, was born, and the family celebrated a new life. By the mid-60s, Margot's father, Jack, was enjoying modest success as a stockbroker in San Francisco and had moved his young family to Mill Valley, an affluent suburb. The girls had a comfortable living. They traveled and excelled in sports, but they themselves were not famous. Well, except on a home stage. Margot attended a nearby private school called Marin Country Day and attracted friends like Bea Kilgore with her personality, not her pedigree. There was something about Margot that was very magnetic and she was a very happy, upbeat girl. So I just remember, you know, going up and saying hi to her, and we started laughing and just became friends. I don't think Margo and I really ever flourished in our academia. Um, she was more artistic. I remember, you know, specifically her loving to draw on the chalkboard, and she loved music. Former music teacher Barry Minia recalls. Margo saying, well, I, I, I remember this. She could have been a singer. She had a sweet voice. It wasn't a big voice at that time. And it was, she had a little bit 
as I remember, kind of a smoky quality to it. But in terms of aspirations for our future, that I don't remember anything coming up that was specific for her. I mean, modeling for sure never came up. Margo and I were definitely the tomboys in the class. Our life really consisted of being outside and it didn't matter what we looked like. But tomboys are not. Girls will be girls. I think we probably had crushes on older classmen. We secretly would spy on them and, and you know, follow them around. But the real man in Margot's life was her father, Jack. Her father was very um, involved in Margot's life, as I think he was with, you know, all the kids. But, you know, she would sort of be her father's buddy. And maybe she was the son he never had. I don't know really how close she was to her mother. I think they had a real sense of family values. Um, I mean, Margot used to write thank you notes after she'd spent the weekend here. In the Hemingway home, character was indeed paramount. I took her on a camping trip. I, this is one of the things I used to do with kids, is take them up in the mountains and backpack or, or just uh, roll around. And we went up to the Stanislaw River in the Sierra. One of the boys in the camp was uh, throwing stones. And I told him in no uncertain terms, you don't throw rocks. Well, he threw one last rock, and Margot stood up and caught the rock right in the side of the face. I was scared to death. She was having a little blood down of the mouth. But she didn't cry. She was absolutely brave and, and kind of physically unusual that way. I was always taught that it was Hemingway-esque to take your blows stoically. There was one weekend where she came over to the house to spend the weekend and her parents had gone away. And Margot told my dad that she had forgotten her think pills. And so my father said, well, sweetheart, you know, what are your think pills? Margot's think pills were Dilantin, a medicine commonly used for the treatment of epilepsy. She had been diagnosed with the disease at age seven and the illness had impaired her learning. Father Jack Hemingway remembers. It would cause you know, her brain to blank out because of her, her, her concentration span was extremely short. She was a very poor student. But like a lot of people with this of that kind, she made up for it by you know, being rather quick about things. She left after the sixth grade. So that was very sad for me because she was such a close friend. I don't think in this day and age you can build friendships like you could as a child. In 1967, Jack accepted a position with Idaho's Fish and Game Commission and built a new house for the family in Ketchum, a small town in their grandpapa's beloved Sun Valley. Sun Valley had been a popular Hollywood resort since the 30s, and both Ernest and Jack were local celebrities. While the family organized the move, the 12-year-old Margot went out ahead and stayed with her godfather at the Tamarack Lodge, where she met Dusty Bell. You know, Sun Valley was sort of our territory. It was, you know, it was all guest people then. You know, there weren't that many of the people that lived up there, so. Margot had finally discovered a playground grand enough to satisfy her Hemingway appetite for adventure. She and her new friends rode horses, camped out, hunted, fished, and hitchhiked their way all over the valley. In the winters, they burned up the slopes, and in the summers, they cooled down in the streams. We used to swim here. In fact, it's a Hemingway hole. To smoke our first cigarettes, you know, get dizzy. Wow. <laughs> Innocent young summers. But soon, Margot discovered some new watering holes and new friends like Paula and Dave Baravento. She followed me into the Pioneer, I believe, was what happened. And I think she just saw a new tall guy in town and she wanted to do some investigation. And uh, I was in there talking with some friends and this little uh, pixie face just came bounding in and and everybody introduced me and it, I was uh, I was amazed by the poise and the character and the uh, dynamic charm that this this 15 year old uh, girl had she was like a free spirit always you know I think that's why we were attracted to each other because I was that way too and I came up here it was like wow anything goes it was just a whole new world and she was she was just that way always very free and 
couldn't wait. They're always exploring and waiting for life to grab her. She had a good imagination, too. She could tell a story, but you never quite knew if they were true or not. <laughs> the art of fiction was in Margot's genes. In fact, she had been named Margot G.O.T. after a heroine in her grandfather's prose. But according to her, she had really been named after the heady Chateau Margot that her parents shared on the night of her conception. So she changed the spelling accordingly. I mean, that was part of her spontaneity. I think I'll be Margot with an X. In a very short time, Margot and her sisters had become Sun Valley celebrities in their own right. Muffet was a budding tennis prodigy, and Mariel a promising ski racer. But while both girls also excelled in school, Margot floundered. She had a hard time in school. She had a learning disability, which people didn't recognize really in the late 60s and early 70s. Um, and I think she always thought she was stupid, which she wasn't. In her junior year, Margot transferred to a private boarding school in Portland. But to her parents' dismay, she dropped out within the year. She later enrolled in art classes at the University of Oregon, but again, left abruptly. Although she wasn't a good student, she was really ready for the world way ahead of time. <laughs> so Margot returned to catch her and spent her late teens drifting in and out of part-time jobs and cowboy bars and reveling in the counterculture that had enveloped Sun Valley. It was um, adolescent <laughs> paradise. It was, it was just so much fun because it was totally uninhibited. Uh, society at that time had a sense of humor. There wasn't the oppression. There wasn't uh, the intolerance that you deal with now. It was wide open. Day of marijuana, everyone smoked marijuana, psilocybin, mushrooms. In a resort area like this, it was just the way it was. It wasn't really that Margot and all her friends and us were a bunch of drug addicts, but that's just how it was up here. It was, you go in a restaurant, sometimes you get psilocybin on the, your dessert. And of course later, we were all met in the rooms of AA up here, but that's just how it was. That was our generation. Like many members of that generation, Margot would suffer the consequences of that freewheeling atmosphere. By age 19, Margot had grown into a uniquely beautiful woman, a wild sunflower nearly six feet tall, or 5'12", as she put it. She decided to try her hand at showbiz and approached talent agent Sandy Mirage with a proposition. I first met Margo on the top of Mount Baldy in Sun Valley, and a friend Rebel had introduced us, and she said to me on the top of the mountain, you know, let's race. And if I win, you have to take me to Hollywood, but if you win, I'll take you home for dinner. So she won. Margot entered the world of modeling all right, but for some reason her early photographs were not well received. So instead, she and Sandy decided to become publicity agents for local Idaho sporting events. We decided to have a try and have an excuse to go to New York. We decided we'd promote a freestyle ski event. We were at the Plaza Hotel and we were sitting having tea and she decided to go up to the room and I made a phone call in the lobby and I had a tap on the back of my shoulder and it was a nice looking gentleman named Errol Wetson with a red rose in his hand. And uh, he wanted to know who that gorgeous woman was that was sitting next to me. He was good looking and he seemed like a man of the world. I was basically a little spit in cowboy boots going yippee, skippy and yahoo. He knocked on my door with a rose and a bottle of champagne and I fell in love. When we return. Just overnight, she became this unbelievable star, and everybody was talking about her, and everybody wanted to meet her and touch her, and that whole gravity that she had. And later, we saw that smiling, fabulous face. I had no idea about the things that haunted her. In her late teens, a restless Margot Hemingway dropped out of high school and went seeking her fortune. She tagged along on a publicity trip to New York and was spotted by entrepreneur Errol Wetson at the Plaza Hotel. The worldly Wetson showered her with roses in hot pursuit. Throughout the summer of 74, Margot maintained a long-distance rapport with her big city beau. Errol Wetson was a sophisticated businessman 
whose family had founded the Wetson hamburger chain. He was 15 years older than Margot and quite a man of the world. Margot was swept off her feet and after three months back west, she flew to New York to be with him. The smitten Mr. Wetson took her to stay with his friend, artist Zachary Zellig. Her hair was all pulled back in a ponytail with bangs and she was wearing big fry boots with, I think, jeans stuck into them and she walked in and she said, howdy. And uh, uh, her eyes were beaming and she was just glowing. The uh, next day, Errol started to ask me to introduce her to all of the business and social networks of individuals that I knew, particularly in, in Manhattan at that time. And here I was working in this fashion industry that, quite frankly, I found to be uh, uh, boring and, uh, and phony. Um, she took them off guard. Now, who is this girl, Margot Hemingway? She's really fat and her eyebrows are so thick and I mean, just negative, 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 negative. Margot was completely and totally naive. I mean, she was just out to have a good time and whatever was going to be fun, she was going to do. In this audio reenactment, Margot recalls those early days. Oh, I'm just a country girl, really. When I got to New York and started modeling, they got so mad when I wouldn't take off 40 pounds. I just told them, take me as I am. I called Wilhelmina, and Wilhelmina was the first person to sign her home. No one else wanted to take her. That was until Zachary and Errol's networking brought Margot to the attention of two of the fashion world's biggest kingpins, designer Halston and photographer Francesco Scavullo. Oh, I remember very well how I first met Margot. I was at a party at Halston. I think he gave the party to introduce Margot to New York. And I went there and standing up on the top of the steps was this fabulous girl. After smiling with a smile, I never saw a smile like that in my life before. There were stars flying out of her mouth. I was under contract to Vogue at that time. So I thought, oh, I gotta run to Vogue and tell them about Margot Hemingway. She's incredible. She was totally charismatic. She had that capacity to touch everyone's heart. And I think the uh, designers and photographers saw that and then of course along with that the editors and the magazines and uh, what have you followed. Fashion editor Marion McAvoy recalls. You know word had gotten around at that point that Margo was new hot ticket in town and I think I might have mentioned it to John Fairchild or Michael Cody who's the editor at that time and I said fine go interview her. Set it up. So Margot landed her first big interview with the fashion industry bible, Women's Wear Daily. By this time, she and Errol had moved into the apartment of another society friend, Egon von Furstenberg. She was wearing so, a sort of large caftan situation. She was bigger than life in, in every sense of the term. A giant, big, wide, toothy smile, eyes that literally pop sparks sort of coming out, out of them, big eyebrows. You know, again, very unslick, unstyled. You know, when she said, hi, y'all, you know, hi, y'all, zippity doo -dah, or whatever, I just thought, hello? But it was for real. She, I don't think, realized how beautiful she was, how honest and sort of straightforward she was. She didn't know how different she was from most people in New York. You know, it was New York 1974, and Manhattan was uh, in a recession, and everybody was crying the blues, and it was uh, not a particularly upbeat time. People were looking and searching for imagery, and they were looking uh, for, you know, something new and something different. So in about a month, uh, we just literally turned New York City upside down. Women's Wear Daily ran Margot's story on the front and back covers and through subsequent stories, kept her there for months. About the same time, her name started making noise around town, and other models, like Beverly Johnson, heard it. I was working for Francesco Scavullo, and there was all of this noise about Margot Hemingway and this great beauty that's coming into the business, and she was very warm and very, very much not like what I expected. Nice big country girl. 
<laughs> came bopping in there. Bad sitting was with her. I couldn't wait for her to come because she'd light up the whole room. She'd come out with that smile. Hi, Francesca. How you doing? And that voice. Oh, how are you? I'm fine as wine. Fine as wine. I thought she was just going to be the sunshine girl. Good. Good. Stop. Supermodel Cheryl Teagues recalls. The first time I, I met Margot Hemingway was uh, in Cancun, Mexico. We were doing a Sports Illustrated shoot, and she was coming down, and I was quite excited to meet this uh, person who I'd heard a lot about. The other girls, you know, we were all laying on the beach, being very glamorous, and, and uh, but there she goes. You know, she's up there on the water skis, and she's climbing the mountains, and she's doing all these things. I thought, wow, here's the first time that uh, a really beautiful girl is also so much an adventurous. By March of 75, Margot Mania had swept Manhattan. It had become a full-blown epidemic. You couldn't look sideways without meeting Margot's radiant gaze. So the hot-to-trot Miss Hemingway decided to break her contract with Wilhelmina and joined the exclusive world of Ford modeling. Then, a chance meeting with Fabergé's Richard Barry branded her for life. Well, at Fabergé, we had started to do a lot of things with celebrities and famous athletes in advertising, especially with Brut Cologne in the early 70s. We decided to come out with a new fragrance line called Babe, sort of uh, a 1970s independent woman, hopefully to be like the next Charlie. And some people that uh, I had met in the industry um, suggested that I meet Margot Hemingway. There weren't really supermodels as we know them today in those days. But um, because of her name, her charisma, our fragrance launch, our high profile in the industry, it all fit together into making this the biggest deal ever with a model, Fabergé's new million dollar babe. Margot had just become the highest paid model in history. No one told me you couldn't start at the top. From that moment on, there seemed to be a lot of champagne and limousines in my life. This really uh, made the profession a legitimate profession, I think. A Hemingway. Being a model gave great weight to that industry. The business was a business that was just becoming the phenomena, the model phenomena, where models had names and personalities and were becoming celebrities. Celebrities indeed. The new beauties declared Time Magazine. And just 275 days after she landed in town, the million dollar Margot epitomized them all. I remember my brother phoning me and saying, you won't believe who's on the cover of Time Magazine. And I said, who? And he said, go buy it. You will not believe it. At that moment, everything was so heady. I mean, here, she's on the cover of Time. She's, uh, you know, she is the most popular 19 year old in the world. She made everyone so happy. Except possibly her family, who had mixed feelings about it all. There was some jealousy among the girls, and also a little fear. After all, the Hemingways were all too familiar with the flip side of fame. But as sentiments at home turned a bit sour, Margot's relationship with Errol grew sweeter. The supermodel and her agent paramour had become very much the super couple. They visited the Plaza Hotel often, and strategized their future over Chateau Margot. In June of 75, despite criticism from family and friends, the duo decided to marry. I couldn't understand why Margot was marrying this person. I just could not understand it because he definitely... He was going to make her famous. Yeah, he was definitely not her, Margot's man. Oh gosh, I suppose it's too easy to say that she was the innocent, unsuspecting person and, you know, he was using her or whatever, but I... I got the distinct impression that he knew very well with whom he was. I never met anyone like him. He's very sort of spiritual. He's in touch with something, a lot of energy. We're good together because we're total opposites. Well, there was a genuine uh, love that was there between both Errol and Margot. Errol was there always, uh, you know, guiding her and directing her and uh, managing her but she did at that point really didn't care I mean she was so busy when your life is that busy and all of a sudden 
you know, you go from being a young girl who's, who's, who's skiing and hiking and having a good time to becoming a, a global celebrity literally within nine months, you, you, you don't have time to think. Despite reservations, the Hemingways accepted the union and the family flew to Paris for the wedding. The affair was held at the Ritz Hotel, a favorite Hemingway haunt, and the couple honeymooned on the Riviera until the time came for the bride to return to New York and start earning that million. You are like no other babe ever born. You're back in the face. You know how to reach out and show your love, babe. In later months, the fabulous fragrance was launched internationally and Margot mania spread overseas. So what does a million dollar babe do for an encore? I remember this little Italian guy sitting behind his desk saying, I'm gonna make you a star. I thought they only said that in the movies. Coming up next. Marriage, career, cover of Time, cover of Urban Fashion Magazine, association with a fragrance launch that was very successful, and then the movie, I don't think she was ready for a failure. I've never seen anyone who could consume the amounts of alcohol that she did. In 1974, in less than a year's time, Margot Hemingway had landed a contract as the highest paid model in history, fallen in love with hamburger heir Errol Wetzel, and become the toast of Manhattan. It wasn't long until Hollywood came courting as well. In 1975, producer Dino De Laurentiis was developing a film called Lipstick, about a beautiful model who avenges her rape and the rape of her sister. Margo was perfect for the lead. So director Lamont Johnson arranged a screen test. I decided it would be a good idea to have uh, a test in the environment that she knew best. Scavullo, who did most of the great covers, a lot of fashion photographer, was a very highly reputable New York photographer. So we set up a, a session in New York where he would do a, a cover session with her. What would my good. mother say in Idaho? Uh, right, like that. Look right in here. Can you see my hands at all? She was always nervous about being photographed until she got into it. You know? And I think uh, when she got the part in the movie, she got a little nervous. Because it was a great big part and it was a starring role and she'd never acted in her life before. Well, Margo was always one to jump into the deep end of the pool and just assume she could swim. So when she was modeling, uh, everybody was saying, you've got to become an actress. We want that face of yours up on the screen. And she said, okay. Well, that's a very brave step to take. And uh, I admire her for it. Margo made another brave gesture on behalf of her younger sister. She showed me a picture of her sister, 13-year-old sister, Mariel. I said, that's perfect. She's the exact person for the, the, the uh, your sister in the piece. She's a star. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think we look like? But Mariel was underage, and the studio required a parent chaperone. So in the fall of 75, the Hemingway family went to Hollywood. They moved into the house in Santa Monica Canyon that was so beautiful. I'll never forget it was filled with orange trees and avocado trees. I think of my life as a fairy tale come true. There's magic dust in the air. Margot went to work in Hollywood, and Hollywood went to work on her with a fervor reminiscent of the old studio days. She was groomed meticulously, and she was very, there was a fortune spent on her uh, massages and massage therapists, the hair. Uh, treatment, the um, the dance exercise classes, the movement exercise, the speech. They worked on their speech a lot. She had this kind of madcap quality about her, and yet she was a tomboy. She was a real outdoor rampageous girl. She was kind of hot, thin, and drag, and yet altogether sexually female. Margot was well liked on the set. But as time passed, her charisma couldn't compensate for her lack of acting experience. Also, the role was becoming more and more uncomfortable for her. Dino wanted a lot more sensationalism. The more we shot, the more he wanted uh, real graphic, juicy rape stuff and uh, sexy stuff. By now, millions of dollars were being spent promoting the film. Expectations were high, and so was the pressure. Let's just say that the pressures were were 
heavier and bigger and more real than ever before in her life. I mean, she was really just scared to death. She couldn't read a script. I had never seen Margo like this. Errol would go off on business and Margo and I were there and she'd just order another bottle of champagne. Some people are built to handle pressure. Some people aren't. When we saw that smiling, fabulous face, I had no idea about the things that haunted her. In April of 76, the film premiered. People started to boo about halfway through uh, because of the, uh, the vulgarity, I mean, the, the obscenities. And uh, people got up and walked out that it wasn't Margo, it was um, dereliction of duty on all our parts. The film was an utter flop. The critics wrote scathing reviews, panning the movie, condemning the producers, and destroying Margot. Film critic Peter Travers recalls. Any model that tries to break into movies has to deal with people like me saying, oh, she's a model. Oh, no, not another one. We're going to have another model act. Lipstick wasn't hack work. It had Anne Bancroft in it. Uh, so there were expectations. People went to this movie thinking, Come on, kid, show me. I want to see what you can do. There wasn't any way for Margot Hemingway to live up to expectations like this, having absolutely no training. It's rare, even today, where you find models breaking in as big as Margot did, where she had to take the starring role in a movie. Because they're looking back and they see the lessons of what happened to people like Margot Hemingway. It's probably all our fault. Because <laughs> we fell in love with her. And we wanted to use her. Not use her, but... We wanted a photograph, but we wanted the best for her. They noticed the little one and not her. So that was tough to take. They noticed the little one all right. As bad as Margot's reviews were, Mariel's were glowing. Mariel stole the show. She could put herself into a child's let's pretend mode. I mean, she could sort of really get into a situation and get very stirred by it. The press anointed Mariel the hot new Hemingway du jour and inflated the sibling rivalry for years. Her relationship with her sister which at that time was uh, i mean an extremely healthy loving um you know very innocent relationship and then all of a sudden the press gets a hold of it and blows it into these ridiculous proportions she ended up stealing the movie and deserved the acclaim but i was upset because it was as if people were tired of me and gave her all the attention you know when you have this enormous rise to the top of fame and fortune and and you know, everybody can't get enough of you. And then the next thing, you're going, hello, I'm over here. If we're talking about the press and the, what I do, I'm very aware that, you know, what's hot today is often cold tomorrow. And as much as I dislike the inhumanity of that, it, it's very much the nature of news. Find me something new, new, new. There was some vindication. Feminist groups actually applauded the film. An odd thing for Flop to be, but nonetheless very influential in terms of other movies copying what that was about. The female Avenger became a major character in movies five or six years later. More significantly, the film influenced rape laws in California. A resolution was named in Margot's honor, and Judge Roy Carstairs presented her with a citizenship award. The entire business of, of rape and, and the uh, difficulty of, uh, of, uh, of uh, convicting the rapist and the difficulties of cross-examination that the victim undergoes was a very hot subject. We gave her the uh, award for bringing to public consciousness uh, what was an immediate, uh, really pressing problem. After Lipstick, Margot resumed her work for Fabergé. By now, perfume sales were skyrocketing. $13 million the first year alone and the line was expanded. After the film, uh, as far as we were concerned, it was business as usual. She was doing new commercials, new print ads for us. She was even more professional as a model. I think she was struggling to find the next step in her fame. And once you were on, you know, the babe, well, I, you know, what do you do after that? Margot did what she did best, played Margot. She ignited on the New York social scene, gracing every gala and adorning every club. I was on the fast track with every beautiful person you could shake a stick at. Everyone was lapping up my Hemingwayness. 
In April of 77, the beautiful people found their home with the opening of New York's legendary Studio 54. Socialite Nikki Haskell even produced a cable show there. You know, people used to say to me, uh, where do you live? And I'd say, well, I live in Studio 54, but I keep an apartment on 68th Street. The great thing about Studio 54, I, I think, was you had, you know, designers and artists and socialites and Wall Street businessmen all in one area dancing and partying and having a great time together. Former Studio 54 owner Ian Schrager. And that was just when this nightclub uh, era was beginning and there was an electricity in the air in New York City. So our idea was why not do a club that uh, catered to all people from all walks of life. And in the same way that you exercise discretion as to who you invite to your home in trying to make for a festive evening and a good party, we tried to exercise that same judgment and discretion uh, for allowing people to come into the club. The whole country was obsessed with what Studio 54 meant and how you got in and how the doorman let you in. And Margot was somebody everybody let in. The tall blonde goddess got right in, into the club and into the VIP rooms, which soon earned a notorious reputation for drugs and decadence. She had put our names on the list and we got, you know, right in. It was overwhelming how big it was. My first thought was, why would Margot want to be in an environment like this? We must have stayed there close to two and a half hours, sort of taking it all in and waiting for Margot to show up. And um, I think someone finally told me that she was in a back room and she couldn't be disturbed. The society at that time was um, much more into a nightlife uh, partying uh, mode than they certainly are today. I never saw Margot take drugs, although I know at certain times she would show up, you know, less uh, coherent than others, but um, that wasn't unusual at that time, really. Uh, so that... When we come back... They can charm the, charm the boots off of your legs. Bernard was an unusual, charming man. And later... Bernard and myself, I mean, basically, we were on the absolute outs. In the late 70s, Margot's disastrous screen debut in Lipstick, along with her insecurity in the fast lane, drove her deeper and deeper into drink. She divorced her husband, Errol Wetson, and became New York's favorite party girl, until she met Bernardo. Bernardo was something else. Bernardo is something else. I guess he's Venezuelan, but he came from a French ancestry, and uh, he, he knew how to live life. He really enjoyed it, and he was friendly, he was happy, he was outgoing could be brooding and sensitive and uh, sexy very yeah that was her her guy Bernard Pouchet Margot's new love was a filmmaker an artist and like his predecessor an entrepreneur 16 years her senior Bernard had also been married before and had children but it didn't take Margot long to win the affection of his daughter Talia Pouchet I had a mixture of feelings at that time because my father was married three times before her my father for me is my, my gold. She was so wonderful herself that it wasn't a problem for her to have the gold. She knew how, in a way, to take care of that gold. I have fallen in love with Bernard. He thrived on adventure. He could go into the middle of the jungle and survive. And that's exactly where they went. From the jungles to the mountaintops to the most romantic cities of the world, Margot and Bernard roamed the globe. Imagine being in the middle of the Amazon, you know, with the Janomamis painting your face and smelling all the earth and listening to the sounds of uh, the, the beings that are there. In 1978, their combined passion for travel and nature led them to produce an award-winning documentary about fly fishing, featuring none other than Margot's dad, Jack. By this time, Margot's babe contract had ended, and she needed a new source of income. She decided to venture back into Hollywood's rough waters to make another fish story, Killer Fish with Lee Majors and Karen Black. 
the reviews were tepid at best. Meanwhile, Sister Mariel was on her own private fast track to the stars. Mariel just didn't go off and do another movie that was successful. She went off and did Manhattan for Woody Allen. And then to top all that off, and what an effect this must have had on Margot, Mariel gets an Academy Award nomination as Best Supporting Actress. Mariel was really fortunate that she followed that up with movies like Personal Best and Star 80. So she's working for Robert Town and Bob Fosse. This is Hollywood's creme de la creme. Margot Hemingway is still stuck doing things like Killer Fish. She's in hack Hollywood work. But at that time, Margot was preoccupied by her life with Bernard. On a snowy New Year's Eve in 1979, the two were wed in Ketchum. Shortly after the nuptials, the couple moved to Paris and Provence for a honeymoon that lasted nearly two years. Bernard had a, um, a wonderful uh, 13th century castle in, in Provence that they, were, that they had been living in. And um, uh, those were very romantic times. I, I don't think Margot you know, drank as much. We went to the south of France, which was the first time I'd ever taken my camera crew and everybody, and we sort of trucked over to Europe for the Cannes Film Festival. We went to this big, it was more than a mansion, it was a castle. And they had a big party in this castle, and Margot was there. I know that that's the first time that I had interviewed her. Thank you for coming on our show. Oh, it's wonderful to join us next week at this time. Okay. <laughs> Margot and Bernard. During this time, Margot and Bernard decided to produce a documentary film about Ernest Hemingway revisiting his famous haunts, but their first challenge was to finance the project. So they met with investors Andrew and Jan Ippolito. It was April 1982 because I recall when we met Margot, it was raining and it was Paris in the rain. I liked her immediately. She has that type of personality that is very charismatic, I would say. Very friendly, very American. Bernard was probably the typical European playboy. They can charm the, charm the boots off of your legs. Bernard was an unusual, charming man. I became fascinated by the, uh, by the project itself. Margot in search of, of Grandpapa, in, in search of Hemingway. I wanted to make the first truly good movie about Ernest Hemingway. I wanted the world to know that he wasn't just a macho man. Andrew Ippolito agreed to raise the money for the film, and Margot and Bernard returned to the States to assist in the effort. They came to live with me, and this was in Los Angeles. They came to live with me briefly, and then they got some money somehow. It was always the thing about money. With financial pressures bearing down on them, Margot decided to take parts in two more B films, Over the Brooklyn Bridge with Elliot Gould, and the martial arts spoof, They Call Me Bruce. What's your plan this time, Rover? You know, I love you just before you get slapped. <laughs> Finally, enough money had been raised to start production on the Ernest Hemingway documentary. We went in their offices once in Santa Monica while they were making it. They had a huge crew working. With people everywhere, stuff going on, but I don't know if any of it was organized. But organized or not, in the fall of 1983, the crew set out in search of Papa. And since Margot would be conducting interviews with her grandfather's prominent friends, she decided to take a crash course in his prose. She had a paperback of A Moving Feast, which is one of Hemingway's most distinguished books and writings. And uh, because of her dyslexia, Margot never got into it. She didn't know how famous her grandfather was. The crew started their European travel in Venice, where Margot's father, Jack, joined the party. Then they made their way to Paris, on the surface, it was quite a romantic journey, rich in culture and history. But below the surface, trouble was born. Yeah. You're so romantic, This was a very social film where we were going places, and it does seem like it revolved around a lot of drinking, and possibly so. However, Margot did like to drink. She enjoyed it tremendously, and she had a great capacity for alcohol. But it didn't affect her. I, I wouldn't say that it did. None whatsoever. She was up early. She was, she did what she was told to do. She was very congenial, very professional. 
but the team was shooting on an intense schedule, getting little sleep and spending lots of money. The pressures became overwhelming. We had all the media chasing us. Everyone knew that Hemingway was in town. Uh, television stations, newspapers, and articles began to appear in the paper. And uh, I accused Bernard of selling out. I accused him of, uh, of perhaps giving too much information to the paper because we really didn't want to have all these hanger-ons. We found ourselves with it. not only our crew, but uh, more than 100, 150 people. Bernard and Margot were, were, were at that point in their relationship when it became awfully strained. There are different moments in life when you are strong and you can take anything from the media. If you don't feel well, you know, if you, you are in a transition that you're thinking about, you know, why you are here, it's hard to have the media also questioning you. The tension between the two of them permeated throughout the whole crew. And it affected everybody. Because the two of them were at each other's throats. You know, it, it became very difficult for everyone to put on a, a happy face. Something must have been brewing before that. As we travel, sometimes you get to know people in a different way. Culturally, they were worlds apart. He was an intellect, an intellect who, who loved to read and write. Margot loved to have fun. The fun came to a definitive end in Pamplona, Spain. The running of the Bulls Festival is an annual ritual which Hemingway popularized in his writing. For a week straight at sunrise, thousands try to outrun a pack of charging bulls. Then they party all day in triumph. Hemingway quotes and distinctly says that never take your wife to Pamplona. You may lose her to a better man. And in some ways, Margo was lost to a better man. It's Ernest himself. Bernard and myself, I mean, basically we were on the absolute outs we were arguing i was i was with this is not very well i don't know i'm getting crazy uh too many i don't understand that too much booze too much fever too much confusion on their last day in pamplona margot and bernard were to film a dramatic bullfight but margot went alone Margot had never seen a bullfight before. She didn't know how to conduct herself because the bullfighter dedicated the bull to Margot. By that time, Bernard was gone. And she cried. That scene in which she cries was when she saw the bull killed. For her, it was the killing of an animal, not the skill of a bullfighter. Blood was coming from the bull's nose. He stumbled and died slowly. I was upset because it seemed like what was happening in my life. When we return. I never really knew at the time how bad her drinking problem was. But we would go out for lunch. I didn't realize that she would drink before we got to lunch. What were her priorities? You know, were they, was it champagne and, and limousines? Or was it backpacking? During the early 80s, Margot met and married the love of her life, Bernard Fouchet. The two embarked on an ambitious documentary about Ernest Hemingway, but the project failed, and so did the marriage. In the fall of 1984, after a painful breakup with Bernard, Margot returned to Idaho, seeking consolation from her family. But she met with mixed feelings instead. The kind of lives that you that you've chosen uh, are tough on you. Because, I mean, I, I saw what effect fame had on, on, uh, on Papa, both in a positive and negative way. It seemed to me I heard you or Mary Ella, or both of you at some point said, don't worry, Daddy, I'll never change. But you do. Mariel was off preparing for her upcoming marriage to Steve Christman, manager of New York's Hard Rock Cafe, and Margot's efforts to connect with her older sister, Muffet, who by now was married herself, were also unsuccessful. When are you going to play tennis with me? Yeah, I'll play any time. I want you to stay and I'd play tennis with you every day. Well, so far, it's been two days, and every morning, it's brought down. 
Well, I can't. You can't play. If you play at nine o'clock in the morning, Margo, it's icy out there. You freeze to death. The ball won't even bounce. That winter, Margot decided to escape to the Austrian Alps for a holiday ski vacation. But the mountains got the better of her. She fell, cracked her pelvic bone and several vertebrae, and was rushed into emergency surgery. I remember she called me from the hospital in Switzerland. She said, oh, well, I, I, I missed a mogul and I broke my, you know. And what was bad at that time is that she started really using, you know, the prescription drugs and the painkillers uh, and drinking in the hospital. And so she was constantly trying to anesthetize this pain and fill this hole up, this emptiness inside. For the next six weeks, Margot lay bedridden in a friend's London apartment, becoming more and more bloated with drink. Divorce procedures were underway with Bernard. And in her despair, her thoughts turned to her grandfather and suicide. You love life. I mean, if you can't drink anymore, if you can't, if you can't write in the... your best hand, which he obviously did. You can't um, enjoy love anymore. The love of a woman, the love of um, uh, the outdoors. I mean, I justify it. Margot's fast lane lifestyle had finally landed her in a ditch. On top of all her personal pain, the IRS smacked her with a $900,000 bill for back taxes. Her only source of income was foreign films and commercials. Usted no reconoce la tarjeta American Express. American Express, la tarjeta más respetada. Still determined to pull herself up and out of her hole, Margot moved back to New York. I was shocked. I never seen Margot. I mean, huge. I was so sad for her. I felt my heart. I'd never seen her this big before. I never really knew at the time how bad her drinking problem was. But we would go out for lunch. I didn't realize that she would drink before we got to lunch. I was on a merry-go-round of restaurants and wine lists, Bordeaux reds and Bordeaux whites. I would tell people that I was busy, but all I was doing was painting abstracts at home. You know, when you're Margot Hemingway, it's hard for her to retrench. She was already, she was, she was an icon. I mean, everybody knew her name throughout the world. The fact that she wasn't working was irrelevant. You know, I mean, you'd say Margot Hemingway, they would put her in the same category as Elizabeth Taylor and Sophia Loren and very famous, prominent women of our day. So she could not live up to her own identity. When you become famous and the world adores you, Everything is thrown at you. I mean, and the whole world embraces you. And that hotness uh, is, is almost frightening. Very few people have handled it well. What were her priorities? You know, were they, was it champagne and, and limousines? Or was it backpacking the mountains? But even as Margot struggled to find herself, she never lost the charisma that attracted new friends like Linda Livingston and Gigi Gaston. I met Margot at Millie Kaiserman's. She would go down to hear Millie sing, and Millie would hand her the mic, and she would sing along with Millie and rock the house. I met her with Millie, and she was singing. The way her voice would envelop you, her heart enveloped you. And she was a giver, and she was very, um, she was very lost when I met her. I think she was always hoping that around, around the next corner, her knight in shining armor would come and take her away from all this. But then she's not the only woman that feels that way. And for a brief time, a bright knight did come along. His name was Stuart Sundland. He was a lawyer, a financier, and the son of the governor of Rhode Island. A friend of mine said, we're all going to have lunch at the Russian Tea Room. It sounds like a nice idea. Margo was there. And uh, I looked at her, she looked at me, and we sat down and started uh, liking each other and had a glass of vodka and had some oysters and I sort of never looked back. I had my apartment, she had their, her apartment, but eventually we sort of, you know, clothes began to move and then more clothes began to move and then you realize you don't have much left at the other place. So you end up 
living together. Stuart's a great guy. He was there when, when he came in, I think, a year after I met Margo, during the hard times, and he, he was so there for her. He really, really loved Margo. She was so down at that time. I mean, she needed someone to really help her get to that point where she could go into a detox detoxification program. She was just very toxic, and it, and it did affect the epilepsy, and, and she really was trying to push that under the rug and, and thinking, well, I'll take this small dosage of phenobarbital every day, and, and it's going to control things. But it didn't control things. Margot's alcohol-related seizures became more frequent and more intense until one frightful day she nearly bit off her tongue. I decided that it had been a message to get well or I would die. I called the Betty Ford Center. My parents paid for the treatment. I checked in and I spelled my name, Margot, G-O-T. Coming up next. Oh, you know, group therapy and you're like on the hot seat and everything. And I started sweating inside and going, you know, like an acting class or something yeah. like this. And, and yeah. I got really scared and I went, that we have a lot to deal with here. The late 80s was the darkest period in Margot Hemingway's life. Depressed over her second divorce and financial woes, she drowned herself in drink until an alcohol-related seizure almost killed her. She decided to get help. In January 1988, 28 days after she checked in, Margot checked out of the Betty Ford Center, sober. She immediately launched an intensive health and fitness regimen, determined to shed her excess weight. It's a major psychological, physical change, and, you know, it's, uh, they have various sayings, Betty Ford, and you know, change your place and change your players so you don't go back to the same old habits. So I think, that, you know, she really was very disciplined about her exercise and you know, she didn't drink at all. And Margot also launched another campaign which she kept up for the rest of her life, confessing her sins and healing others. Margot preached the virtues of sobriety on the lecture circuit, in print articles, on the networks, tabloids and talk shows, even the BBC. I wanted everything that they had to offer, the 12 steps and all this stuff, and, and it was very important to me to get this because it was like, because before I went in there, it was like, it was either, okay, I can kill myself. Yeah. It seemed like a pretty good option, but there's one <laughs> idea, maybe I'll try life again. Okay. <laughs> Not only did Margot discuss her alcoholism, but she finally spoke openly about her ongoing battle with bulimia, impressing colleagues like model Kim Alexis. In our business, um, no one really says, how'd you get that thin? <laughs> do you throw up? Do you just starve yourself? What do you do? And I think that when she talked about it on these shows, she probably helped herself by helping these other people, by her talking about it and being able to get it out in the open. And producer Ronnie Stoller. She was willing, more so than anyone I'd ever seen, to expose the most vulnerable, most painful, and what could potentially